this Fascia Congress. I have the pleasure to look again together with you how fascia responds to different stimulation and now specifically how it may respond to therapeutic stimulation. And you're noticing I'm trying to speak a little bit slower because in Portuguese you have more words for translation. So if I speak with 10 words per second, they have to speak with 15 words per second. So I hope this works better than before. I was involved in a mathematical study how much pressure per square centimeter you would need to apply in order to induce a plastic deformation. Plastic means a lasting, not just a temporary elongation. And that study was based on measuring the potential force you can apply with the elbow of a strong rolfer. Uh, you can give up to 20 kilograms per square centimeter on the tissue, but not more. Um, and how if that force would be sufficient to make, for example, the plantar fascia a little bit longer, or to make the iliotibial band a little bit longer. Because that had been a big debate in the Rolfing community, but also outside, whether you can change and whether you need strong touch or whether you can do it with light touch to in induce a plastic deformation in, in the connective tissue. In the muscle, we know often just relaxing and telling them relax will, tell, will, will reduce the muscle tonus. But how about the dense connective tissues? So when we looked at the literature, we came to a very frustrating first conclusion. For dense fascia, and most of the data we had came from the fascia lata in the iliotibial tract, or from the plantar fascia, because there we have more data. The pressure that a human strong person can apply is not sufficient to induce a plastic deformation during the treatment on a pure biomechanical level, meaning on a butcher level. If I give you a dead piece of fascia lata that doesn't have a connection with the nervous system that may translate it to the brain, and the brain and the autonomic nervous system would then change something else outside of the fascia or may, may uh, get more water into the fascia. So on a pure biomechanical dead piece of fascia, our pressure is not strong enough to induce a change. So you need another explanation besides the brutal force and the viscoelastic plasticity of the connective tissue. However, when you look at loose connective tissue, and we took the data from cosmetic surgery, there we knew about the thickness and the viscoelastic property of the superficial nasal fascia, because cosmetic surgeons do a lot of research. And there, it is possible to induce a plastic deformation purely on a butcher viscoelastic biomechanical um, uh, level. Now that is partly frustrating, but uh, actually we could loosen some fresh adhesions. For example, here, this is, I've shown this before, when you have, for example, adhesions between the superficial fascia and the fascia profunda behind the cervical thoracic junction. You have that often in, pe in adult people, not in young persons. And we looked at it in rats, where they also have this increased adhesion. And when you peel the superficial fascia away from the fascia profunda, you see these tiny strands of adhesions. And uh, as far as I know them, their density is similar to the nasal fascia. 
So when you have fresh adhesions that are restricting the mobility of the superficial fascia, then manual pressure may be sufficient to loosen that. That has been shown that you can loosen fresh adhesions in a very important and inspiring study that came out of the second fascia research congress where there was a debate between one of the scientists and one of the clinicians. It was a similar conference to here. And at the break, they were discussing at the coffee break, she was treating visceral adhesions in many people who have abdominal surgery. And she told him that she can feel them and she can loosen them with roughing inspired myofascial release. And he said, I don't believe you because we do these adhesions in our rats and you cannot loosen them. And then you have the typical debate, clinical experience versus arrogant, closed mind scientist. Now, Susan Chappelle, who was this clinician, she didn't give up. She knew she can loosen it because she can feel it. But she also knew that this closed minded at that time, scientist is not the only one on this planet that she has other closed mind scientists in Vancouver where she is practicing. So she asked him, what does it take to convince somebody with your mindset? And he said, you need to do really well-conducted clinical research. And she said, tell me more. To make a long story short, they did a research together, and she's one of my heroes. She was not a scientist before. She was a clinician, like many of you are. But she was willing to collaborate with the scientists. She flew on her own expense from Vancouver to Boston several times. And he told her, if you do research, you need to do it with a proper design. Otherwise, people will tear it afterwards. Don't do it like a clinician would like to do it the first time. You need to follow a high quality scientific protocol. And he, and he was involved in doing that. So in that very amazing study, they took laboratory rats and they induced a visceral adhesion. So under anesthesia, they opened the belly wall and they scraped with the blunt side of a scalpel on the inside of the peritoneum and on the outside of the large intestine and then they closed it again. And they knew that procedure leads to adhesions in the majority of these rats. So if you scrape, if you do a slight wound irritation on, a, on two membranous layers that are lying close to each other, they will adhere, not in three hours, but in a few days. And then she treated one group of the rats, but randomly, not the ones that she liked, but the ones that the scientists gave her, <laughs> Uh, she was allowed to do Rolfing-inspired myofascial treatments once a day. Another group did only get uh, uh, tender loving care for the same amount, so stroking and talking to them for the same amount of minutes. <laughs> and then they compared them after several weeks. And then the scientist, not she herself, because she would be biased, the scientist looked at the degree of adhesions in both groups. And you can see in the, in the group, this is a typical example. Actually, when scientists say a typical example, they take the most extreme example to show you <laughs> so that everybody can see it. So it's one example, a very nice example, where you see in the untreated group, they had strong adhesions between the large intestine and the peritoneum. And in the other group that had been treated by her myofascial treatment, you had much looser uh, adhesions between them. Uh, and uh, so that proved if you are skilled, if you have skilled hands like Susan Chappelle has, uh, if you are treating rats, and if the adhesions are fresh, that you can loosen, she was not able, in two of the rats, she was not able to loosen it. But she was smart enough to give it to the protocol before they investigated them. So that also speaks for them. 
So somebody like Susan Chappelle, I would trust if I have an abdominal surgery, a, a, a clinician who says, I have in the majority of my patients, I have success, I feel it, but I also have some patients where I wonder why I don't have the same degree of success. I think they are more open-minded. They are not so missionary where they blame the client if he is not responding. <laughs> and she wanted to find out what is the difference between the two rats where she didn't have the same improvement and the majority of the rats where she had the improvement. Uh, so this proves with fresh adhesions, uh, it is possible to loosen these adhesions, and that's not a contradiction to our mathematical study, because the fresh adhesions may have a, a similar density uh, that the nasal fascia has. So there, your force may be sufficient. Uh, Jean-Claude Gimberto, who some of you know, is this French surgeon who investigates the fascia with an endoscope. And he showed us an explanation why maybe she was not successful in the two rats where, she, where the adhesions were as strong. And he showed us an, an adhesion that you have sometimes in cesarean section uh, in a woman where you also have abdominal surgery, and that always leads to some kind of adhesions. The question is, how strong are they? And can they be resolved with proper yoga, with proper myofascial manipulation? And here you see a very strong adhesion between an ovary and the peritoneum. This is not where it should belong. And some osteopaths, they can feel the adhesion after abdominal surgery and loosen it. But here, Gimberto claims it will not be possible to loosen it because of something you can see here with your eyes. What do you see here? Why it would not be possible, maybe not even desirable, to loosen the ovary, to detach it from the peritoneum you see continuous blood vessels have formed. And the blood vessels, they also have their fascial envelope, are much sturdier than normal loose connective tissue. And above all, you don't want to rupture those blood vessels. They are not only stronger, but, uh, and will resisting more than normal loose connective tissue, but if you rupture them, you have uh, other problems to deal with. So that is a nice explanation why sometimes in adhesions, if they are fresh, your mechanical force may be sufficient, but already in some cases it may not be possible because you may have too much collagen type 1 going along with the blood vessels or other hard connective tissue. So then we have to look at what else may be happening under our hands. And the Stekos have proposed a new model that I find very inspiring based on ultrasound examination. The ultrasound uh, is an easy tool now that you can put, for example, on the fascial envelope of the sternocleidomastoid. And in a healthy person, the fascial envelope around the sternocleidomastoid is between one and two millimeters thin. In some of the myofascial neck pain patients, it is three millimeters thick. And then they say the myofascial pain of the neck pain is associated with an increased fascial thickening. And then the question is, how can you make a thick, so it would be a fibrotic pathology. So you have more collagen type one, Instead of one and a half millimeters, you have three millimeters there. And then, according to my belief, I say belief because I'm not 100% sure, uh, certain, but because of the mathematical calculation that we did, you could not soften that envelope in one hour of a roughing session, not in short term. However, there are some changes in which the envelope feels as hard to your hand, but in the ultrasound, you see the thickening of the envelope is not due to more collagen compared with he, here, but to a new zone 
of non-fibrillar ground substance that contains a high amount of hyaluronan that you have been calling hyaluronic acid in the past, but it's not an acid. And they suggested to call that a densification. Hyaluronan normally is a liquid substance and it makes uh, heart tissue more soft, more slippery. However, they found indications, that means not 100% evidence yet, but strong indications, that this zone here is a particularly sticky and gluey hyaluronan. So when hyaluronan is in an acidic condition, for example, um, or you have too much of it, it, it forms a big molecular binding and then it becomes like a sticky glue. And that sticky glue then is responsible for the stiffness that you have in the envelope. And there is not much doubt that you can change hyaluronan with the pressure that you have under your hands in a matter of minutes. The Stecos even found some cells that are specialized on producing hyaluronan. They are fibroblasts. Uh, and they suggest the name fascia sites for them. They are specialized not on collagen production and not on collagen removal, but on production of hyaluronan. And they can produce that in a matter of a few seconds and a, and a few minutes. And they tend to produce that when you have local shearing motion. They don't produce it when you have immobility at that area where the fascia sites are located. So maybe that is what we are doing with our roughing manipulations, with our yoga manipulations, with your myofascial release, with your connective tissue massage, is that we stimulate the fascia sites to produce more lubricant hyaluronan and or we squeeze the existing old hyaluronan to change from large molecular sticky condition into a small molecular and then more lubricant condition. And we know that this change is possible and that it doesn't take much force. But if you ask me, show me any videotape where somebody has demonstrated this happening in a standard roughing session, we don't have that. But we have strong indications in that direction. So that would be one exception then. So you can have a plastic change if, you have, uh, if you're not changing collagen type one, but you change the hyaluronan in the ground substance. Whether that is possible has not yet been shown with myofascial release, but in a recent foam roller study and uh, I, I'm not claiming that a self-myofascial release treatment on a foam roller can sufficiently or to the same level replace a skilled roughing or osteopathic session. However, for the fibroblast, it's a similar stimulus. The fibroblast under the skin does not know what name you have on your door, whether you call yourself rolfer or chiropractor. It responds to Newton, shear forces, compression, to timing and force, to biomechanical, because you're not giving a pharmaceutical injection, you're doing a biomechanical deformation. So for the fibroblast, it may be similar, partly similar, to what your rolfing elbow is doing. And this was a recent study that we had the privilege to uh, mentor to supervise where they took healthy people and they looked at the sheer motion ability of the lumbar fascia. And as I was sharing this morning, in chronic low back pain you have restricted shearing. So if you can increase the shearing in healthy people, maybe that would be also beneficial when treating low back pain patients. And in that study it had been clearly shown that when you treat yourself for 10 minutes on a foam roller at the, at the lumbar dorsal fascia, but also at the hamstring fascia, and you now understand the reason why, because particularly the second layer of the lumbar dorsal fascia continues into the hamstrings, 
that then afterwards you have an increased shearing motion there. Uh, these videos are not from that study. I only put them there so you see the direction of the change. So that already has been published, but in the recent study that she will present at the Berlin Congress, she also looked at the shearing motion between the first layer and the second layer. And now she was also able to show after south myofascial release, you also have more shearing motion between the first layer and the second layer. So that demonstrates that the forces that we have available as Rolfus is sufficient to induce an architectural change. How adhesive the tissues are with each other. We don't know what happens in between, whether it's a more slippery hyaluronan or whether it's another chemical or architectural change, but we know that this kind of manipulation is sufficient to change the biomechanical mobility of the tissue. A more interesting dimension for me, rather than this still butcher level by viscoelastic deformation is what happens with the nervous system. And that was something that already Andrew Taylor still knew, which Eidolroff did not know, Moshe Feldenkrais did not know it, that fascia has a lot of sensory nerves embedded in it. And we know some of them are free nerve endings for potential pain perception, but there are also many of them who are proprioceptive nerve endings, Golgi receptors, Pacini receptors, Ruffini receptors, and if you want to include the muscle spindles, because they are embedded in the perimuseum, you would include them too as a proprioceptive nerve endings. And we are stimulating them, not on a butcher piece of meat, but in a healthy client. And in a healthy client, if I apply pressure or tension to the IT band, to the iliotibial band, I produce proprioceptive stimulation to the spinal cord. And maybe that induces some changes that go beyond the butcher level deformation of the collagen tissue. And that is now my preferred explanation for the beneficial pain inhibiting effect of many myofascial therapies. Some of you know that concept as the gate control theory that was already proposed in the 90s, that in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, you have competing information, and it was believed the faster information wins. Now that has been shown to be not precisely correct. It's not the speed, but you have some neurons, so this is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They are now called wide dynamic range neurons. That means they are open for different kind of input. Could be nociceptive input, it could be proprioceptive input, but they are greedy for input, and that is a new insight. If they don't get regular input, they make problems. They have to fight for survival because then the central nervous system may cut them off. So if you don't have sufficient proprioceptive stimulation, so here they are open for proprioceptive stimulation that comes in via an inhibitor, uh, via, via an, an intermittent neuron, or they are open for nociceptive stimulation, but they need to give regular reports to the central nervous system. And what has been shown is in these wide dynamic uh, uh, range neurons, you have a mutually inhibiting influence of the amount of proprioceptive stimulation versus nociceptive sensitivity. So it is like oil and water. If you have a lot of oil, you cannot have a lot of water, so they inhibit each other. And that is a new and an intriguing concept and has been shown in many directions. For example, if you artificially induce low back pain, which is the Australian study with the hypotonic saline injection, then the proprioception gets diminished. So if you sit these people on a proprioception chair where they are blindfolded 
and an engine turns their pelvis one degree per second to the right or to the left in relationship to their trunk, which is fixated to the chair. And you ask a patient, tell me when you notice whether your pelvis is turned to the right or to the left. For a healthy person, you don't need 45 degrees before you can tell where your pelvis is. You can, uh, somewhere between five and 10 degrees, you can tell without looking that your pelvis is turned to the right. If you are a Pilates teacher, you may be a little bit more sensitive than an academic couch potato, hopefully. However, if you give the, to, to the Pilates proprioception queen acute low back pain via this injection, then she needs twice as much before she can tell where her pelvis is turning. So that is one example that if you push the scale up here, proprioception will go down the baseline. It has also been shown in rats, if you inhibit proprioception with a certain poison, then they become hypersensitive to potential pain that you have in there. Now what we are doing with our hands, we are stimulating Ruffini receptors, we are stimulating Golgi receptors, and that is new input to these input-hungry wide dynamic range neurons. And if you don't have, for example, if you have two lumbar fascia glued together, in the past you had regular movement there. Whenever you were bending down to untie your shoes, to stretch in the morning, you had a relative movement, and the VDR neurons associated with that tissue region in your body, they would get regular reports, and they would be happy. However, if these two lumbar fascia are glued together, they have nothing to report. And their chef will tell them, you will be fired soon. You know, my journal needs some local news from your village. Please look for something. What do you do if you are a journalist and nothing is happening in your village because it's summer vacation? You take out a magnifying glass and you take out of a little ant, you make it out to, to a nociceptive elephant. So you pass by a waste basket and you see a banana peel being outside and not inside of it. Normally you don't give a shit. However, if you don't have any proprioception from your village, from your zone of innovation, you say this is my chance. And you report to the spinal cord Holy cow, you know, uh, there is a minute change in the firing here. So, so, so you would say uh, our village is uh, being uh, uh, polluted by the refugees or whatever, and you have a big story. So that is one scenario for a client for whom one millimeter leg length difference leads to low back pain, may even to jaw pain. I'm not saying that's always the case, but it's a plausible explanation. So that is now in a very appealing uh, concept that we are not stretching collagen and making it longer, we are stretching collagen in order to stimulate Ruffini receptors Golgi receptors that then are giving to the wide dynamic range neurons a functional, useful, efferent proprioceptive input, and then they can put down their magnifying glass, and you can live with a one centimeter lag length difference without any problem there. You don't need to sensitize uh, the potential nociception. So proprioception is called the sixth sense, and maybe what we have in common as movement therapists, as manual therapists, is that we are stimulating proprioception. And I want to show you an extreme example of somebody, and that is very rare, who lost all proprioception below his neck due to a very rare overactivity of his immune system. And there is a book in the literature that I highly recommend, and I was involved when he was exam uh, examined at the Max Planck Institute in Munich, and that really was very impressive to me. And 
I, I show him how he walks because he's the only person who taught himself to walk without facial proprioception. And that is an Olympic achievement. It took him four years of training. So that would be comparable to you crossing on a unicycle on a rope over the Niagara Falls and backwards. You cannot do that with one year of training. But in four years, if you are a master Olympic athlete, you may be able to do that. So when your client walk, they feel their plantar fascia, they feel their IT band, and for them it's very easy when you came back from the break. However, you see how concentrated he Athletes is. His name is Ian Waterman. Competitions. And, that's their and that's he does it to. like a robot. So he has a fixed step length at which he always walks there. Almost an over the top statement, but it's and uh, so if the light goes out, he will fall down. And that is a very uh, intriguing example when a client doesn't have proprioception, maybe because of gluing, maybe because of oversensitization of the nervous system for nociception, that then they may be walking a little bit clumsy. If you have some clients who walk similar to him, it's not a graceful walk, but you wouldn't drop your jaw to the floor if you see a client walking in like that. Because you have a lot of low back pain patients, they walk in a similar robot-like gait. Now, what he doesn't have is fascial proprioceptive in his lumbodorsal fascia. And my Rolfer and scientist colleague, Achotson, he is now comparing how people with low back pain walk different with their lumbar fascia as opposed to healthy people, and also how cultural conditioning is influencing your gait. So this is my favorite gait from some women in Western Africa who carry their children on the lumbar dorsal fascia and supposedly they use the lumbar dorsal fascia, the first and the second layer, as an elastic spring, as an elastic membrane. And there have been two studies in nature how these women have a very energy efficient gait where they can walk for hours with a big weight on their head without burning more calories than without the weight. However, that is related to their gait speed. If you ask them to walk slower or to walk faster than their intuitive comfort speed is, then they apparently walk in the same way as British soldiers had been walking in that study where the more weight you have, the more calories you burn, which we explain that they use more muscles for movement. Of course, you need muscles for movement, but in the African gait, the muscles store some of the kinetic energy, apparently, in the fascial system. And if you have a brain that can sense the tension in the fascial system, then you adapt the resonant frequency of your muscles to the resonant frequency of your elastic recoil fascia. And that makes this elegant walking. For the rolfers, for the rolfing movement people, this is what we had called the psoas gait. So where you see a pelvic notation, a pelvic swinging going in a similar direction like the swinging leg that is going forward. So uh, my uh, hypothesis is somebody who has no low back uh, proprioception, like Ian Waterman, he will not be able to walk like that. Because for that, you need to have minute sensation. Am I before the turning point in the elastic swing? Am I afterwards? So you have to measure the fascial loading in fractions of, uh, of, of a second. And he cannot replace that just by his uh, visual perception that he has there. Let me switch forward to some new insights that just have been published a few months ago where they looked at the relationship between stiffness of the erector spinae and, and, and fascia. So they used a, a digital finger 
that put a certain load on the lower back and you measure the resistance. And most of us clinicians, we have an association that if your lower back is more hard, more stiff on the right, and you have pain on the right side, you say the stiffness is the reason or is associated with the reason of your low back pain, so you need to relax more. And we rolfers are good in relaxing stiff tissues. We are not so good in stiffening soft or too soft connective tissues. But we have been thinking that the low back pain is associated with the stiffening. Now they did a new study with chronic low back pain. So maybe that may explain the surprising finding. And they found out there is no correlation between the objective stiffness, not measured with a human finger, but with a computer indentation, and how painful your lower back is. And also not how strong you perceive the pressure. So you, you push here, let's say, with half a kilogram, and you ask the client, how many kilograms is my finger, my digital finger, the computer finger, applying there? And what they found out is that the chronic low back pain people are less precise in their perception in regards to the initial intensity. They tend to overestimate. You push with one kilogram and they say 10 kilograms. So they are less precise. However, they are more precise in perceiving changes. So if you change 10% towards stiffening and 10% towards softening, they detect it more than a healthy patient. So their conclusion was that the chronic low back pain is not associated to how stiff your myofascial tissue is, so you may waste your time in relaxing it, unless we look at it in a different angle in a minute, uh, that the low back pain is associated to a cortical state of protection. Because if you are in a protection mode where you associate this body part with potential threat and injury, then that explains why you overestimate the initial force and why you are more sensitive for potential increases in, in, in that condition. So that was their hypothesis. They did a very elegant uh, second study where they said, okay, we do a manipulation where we don't treat the stiffness of the tissue, we only treat the brain. And they did that with a sound. So let me show that to you. Where is my mouse? Yeah, so here I need the... So they accompany the pressure with an alarming sound. And then both groups tend to overestimate. They say 10 kilograms or 20 kilograms, when in fact you use three, three kilograms. However, the overestimation was much bigger in the chronic low back pain patients. And then they made a soothing sound. This is terrific. So, can you hear it? I, I run it again. It, it's too good. So they suggest, and that's my provocative suggestion to you, the sounds you make as a therapist when you fantasize the tissue is getting softer. Oh, yes, your tissue is getting softer. The sound quality is the major therapeutic impact. When you say, oh, here, it's really hard here, squeaking sound, you are really stiff, then you are increasing the pain. So it's not the stiffness of the tissue, it's the catastrophizing or sedating effect on the client. That just you're working in an area where they have been in protection mode, and the longer you work, the more they relax. It may be the effect where they get it through your sound, through your breathing, 
but they may also get it through their associations. I used to think this is dangerous, but he's working there in three minutes, and it's actually not dangerous. So that would be the cortical change that has been uh, involved in this study. So that would mean that psychotherapy and making sounds could potentially be as efficient as a roughing elbow or a yoga stretch. However, I'm not completely convinced about that because we know from the neck, from acute neck pain, that there is indeed an association between stiffness and myofascial sensitivity. So they showed in earlier studies, not shown on the lower back in chronic low back pain, but on acute neck pain, that the side which you have more neck pain, let's say the right side, tends to be also stiffer if you measure that with an indentometer. So maybe in the future, we need to distinguish between these different influences. Finally, as one more aspect, we are changing the fluid content in the connective tissue. So like in a sponge, and we have shown that in a study at Ulm University, if you stretch connective tissue, we did it in an organ bars, but also if you apply a roughing pressure elbow to the lumbar fascia, during the manipulation, you squeeze water out of the sponge. That is not a surprise. And then it takes more than 10 seconds, usually minutes, can be up to 10 minutes, for the water to come back. And sometimes you have even more water coming back than was before in the sponge. That, that's a very intriguing uh, uh, aspect. And now it has been shown that the fibroblasts, which are the main architects of collagen production, but also the uh, production of inflammatory cytokines in the connective tissue, that they respond to fluid shear because they have little hair-like tentacles. They are called cilia, and they respond to side bending induced by the liquid ground substance bending. So when the ground substance moves, which sometimes is more liquid and sometimes it's more sticky, it side bends the primary cilium. And depending on the degree of fluid shear, they produce very different cytokines. And one particular study that I want to use to end with, and maybe that's a good transition to the next lecture uh, on, on scar treatment, uh, when you use a fluid shear which is very, very slow, 6 uh, per square centimeter is a very slow motion movement. Uh, so it would mean for my roughing hand to move not one centimeter per second, but one millimeter per second. So I really have to slow down. Not, it's not the force, but it's a fluid shear. How rapidly do you push the water around the fibroblast? Then the fibroblast produce an enzyme that breaks down collagen, particularly old collagen. It is called MMP1, and that's the most powerful physiological solution to break down connective tissue stiffness. But it's not produced during the manipulation, also not two hours afterwards, but four hours and uh, six hours after the treatment. So that only has been shown in organ bars, in, in cell cultures. However, in my clinical practice, I now take out meditation incense in my mind, and I try to find the slowest continuous rolfing stroke in order to sidebend the cilia in the fibroblast that they produce an enzyme that dissolves collagen type 1, not during my treatment, so I feel no difference, but six hours after the treatment, they may, may start to break down the collagen. So that is a very intriguing model, but it's not been proven. So I'll turn over to the next presentation, and I also wait for the discussions that we have at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.